To say that Breath of the Wild was received with critical acclaim is an understatement. The game received perfect tens across many reputable gaming publications, and even to this day, it remains one of the highest rated games on Metacritic, with an average score of 97. And it wasn't just critics that loved the game, the fans loved it too. With 25 million units sold worldwide, Breath of the Wild holds the title of the best selling Zelda game of all time. The game is a certified critical and commercial success, but that doesn't mean that everyone liked the game. In fact, there's a decent chunk of the Zelda fanbase that doesn't like it at all. Even going so far as to say, it's not even a real Zelda game. And as someone who personally loved the game, this news was shocking to me. And I wanted to find out why people felt this way. And after doing a little digging, I believe I've narrowed it down to three main culprits. Lack of proper dungeons, lack of enemy variety, and the weapon durability system, aka the weapons break too often. And now that I had the reasons, I wanted to put them to the test, so I did what any sane person would do, and compared Breath of the Wild to every other 3D Zelda game in these three categories. The following are my results. Okay, so the first category I wanted to tackle is the lack of proper dungeons. But before we do that, we have to define exactly what a proper Zelda dungeon is. After examining the dungeons in every 3D Zelda game, I think I've come up with a set of criteria that can accurately define what makes a dungeon a Zelda dungeon. The first is a unique theme. So think Shadow Temple, Dragon Roost Cavern, or Snow Peak Ruins. They all have a distinct look and feel to them that separates them from the rest of the dungeons in their respective games. You would never walk into the Shadow Temple, for example, and think you're in the Water Temple. The next is, the dungeon must contain an item as a reward. And not just any item. This item must be used in the dungeon to make progress. So think of the Megaton Hammer found in Ocarina of Time's Fire Temple, or the Boomerang found in Wind Waker's Forbidden Woods. One is used to break rocks and knock down giant pillars, and the other is used to cut vines and kill multiple enemies at once. But both are found in their respective dungeons, and both are used to make progress in said dungeons. So, Ocarina of Time's Ice Cavern would break this rule for example, as it does contain an item, the Iron Boots, but you're not actually required to use the item in the Ice Cavern. This may seem like a small distinction, but it's important. This over anything else is what really distinguishes a Zelda dungeon from a regular video game dungeon. The next one I came up with was keys. Small keys, boss keys, any kind of keys really. All you need for this one is a locked door and a key to open it. Next up is bosses. To be a true Zelda dungeon, there needs to be at least one boss the player has to overcome in the dungeon. There can be a mid boss, but it's not essential. Just as long as there's some kind of boss in the dungeon, it still qualifies. And finally, we've come to our fifth and final set of criteria. A reward for story progress. So this would be anything like Din's Pearl from Dragon Roost Cavern, or God's Remains from Snowhead Temple. Any kind of key item that is no other use than to push the story forward in some way. Okay, so now that I've established the ground rules, we can go over what I did next. I applied all these rules to each and every dungeon in every 3D Zelda game. Just so I could see which game had the most legitimate Zelda dungeons, and which had the least amount. So let's start at the beginning. Ocarina of Time. Ocarina of Time has 8 proper Zelda dungeons. No real surprises here. Bottom of the Well was disqualified for no reward for story progress. Ice Cavern and Gerudo's Training Ground for the item rule as well as Ganon's castle for the same reason. Spoiler, every endgame dungeon is like this. None of them have an item used to progress through the dungeon, so none of them qualify. Majora's Mask's four main temples all qualify under these rules. However, none of Majora's mini dungeons qualify as they all break at least one of the five criteria. Wind Waker has five in total, the three Din's Pearl dungeons and the two to restore the Master Sword. Forsaken Fortress unfortunately gets disqualified for a lack of keys. Twilight Princess comes in at 8, 
and Skyward Sword at six, with no real surprises in either. And finally, we've come to Breath of the Wild. Right off the bat, every single one of Breath of the Wild's shrines gets disqualified by the item rule, as well as multiple other ones. So, that just leaves us with Breath of the Wild's six other dungeons. The Four Divine Beasts, Hyrule Castle, and the Final Trial DLC. And they actually all fail on multiple accounts. For starters, not one of them has keys. And none of them have an item you unlock in the dungeon. Five out of six have a boss fight, with the final trial being the only one without one. They all have a unique themes, so that's good. And only one of them has a reward for story progress, which is Hyrule Castle because you can beat the game without ever touching the Divine Beast. When it's all said and done, Breath of the Wild comes out with a total of zero proper Zelda dungeons. So yeah, I would say that the lack of proper Zelda dungeons complaint is a valid one. So the next biggest complaint is the lack of enemy variety in Breath of the Wild. For this one, I counted every enemy in each 3D Zelda game and compared them to each other to see which game had the most enemy variety and which one had the worst. I basically counted everything that would actively try and attack the player as an enemy. So stuff like the boulder or spike trap wouldn't count, because they aren't aware of the player character. They have a set path to follow that just happens to get in the player's way. They are more of a trap than an actual enemy. I also didn't count an enemy if it was a clone of an enemy I already counted. I'm considering a clone any enemy that shares a character model with another enemy, but has a small change like the color is different. So enemies like the Fire Keys and Ice Keys would be counted as one enemy even though there's two of them. Alright, so let's get into it. Ocarina of Time has 73 total enemies. Seven of which I classified as traps, which I crossed out with a beautifully drawn red X. Ocarina of Time also has 15 clone enemies, which I crossed out with an equally as stunning blue X. So if we subtract the traps and clones from the total number of enemies, we're left with 51 unique enemies in Ocarina of Time. Majora's Mask has 79 total enemies, 11 traps, and 15 clones, for a total of 53 unique enemies. Wind Waker only has 53 total enemies, 5 of which are traps and 11 which are clones for a new low of 37 unique enemies. Twilight Princess has 82 total enemies, 0 traps, it also had 20 clones for a total of 62 unique enemies. Skyward Sword had 64 total, 1 trap and 18 clones for a total of 45 unique enemies. And last, but not least, or maybe in this case least, Breath of the Wild, which has 71 total enemies, 49 which are clones, for a total of 22 unique enemies. Breath of the Wild has almost half the unique enemies as the next lowest game, Wind Waker, and almost three times less than the highest game, Twilight Princess. And it has 49 clones! which is almost the same amount as all the other games combined. So, I can see why people feel like Breath of the Wild has an enemy variety problem, because compared to the other Zelda games, it doesn't come close. Therefore, I would call this complaint valid. So the last critique I'll look at is the weapon durability system, aka the weapons break too often. This one was a little difficult, as I really didn't have anything else to compare it to, as none of the other Zelda games have a durability system like this. So I decided to take 5 weapons that can be found in Breath of the Wild and pit them against an enemy and see how long each of them take to break. I went with 1 weak weapon, 3 weak to medium weapons, and 1 medium strength weapon and the enemy I decided to pit against them was the most common enemy in the game, the Red Babobkin. Bacoblin? Bacoblin. So, let's break down how this is gonna work. Every weapon in Breath of the Wild has an attack power number, and a durability number. Attack power being how much damage the weapon does to an enemy, and durability being how many hits a weapon can dish out before it breaks. The Soup Ladle, for example, has an attack power of 4, 
and a durability of 5. So it can dish out 5 attacks at 4 damage each, giving it a potential of 20 total damage before it breaks. A red Bacoblin has a max HP of 12, meaning that the Supladle can only kill one red Bacoblin before it breaks, as it can only do 20 damage and would need 24 to kill two. So let's take a look at the rest of our list and see how many red Bacoblins each weapon can kill before they break. Honestly, just looking at this, it really doesn't seem that bad. You can kill 14 Bacoblins with the Spike Boko Club, 16 with the Traveler's Claymore, and 95 with the Knight's Claymore. Looking at this, it really doesn't seem like the weapons break too often in Breath of the Wild at all. The problem is though, the Red Bokoblin is one of the weakest enemies in the game. If we use the same weapons against stronger enemies like the Lazalfos or the Blue Moblin, the outcomes start to look a bit different. The Traverse Claymore could kill 16 Red Bokoblins before breaking, but it can only kill 4 Lazalfos and 1 Blue Moblin before it shatters. Only being able to kill 4 enemies before your weapon breaks is kind of a tough look, and let's not even talk about the soup ladle. Oof. Obviously, these are weak weapons being used against stronger enemies, so of course they're gonna look bad. The Knight's Claymore, for example, still holds up really well, being able to kill 22 Lazalfos and 12 Blue Moblins before breaking. Unfortunately though, these numbers alone don't give us a clear answer to our question of, do the weapons break too often? As there is no other game in this series that uses a system like this, there is no clear point of reference telling us if these numbers are bad or not. So I'll have to leave this complaint as undetermined for now. At the end of the day though, it really just comes down to preference. If you like breakable weapons, you'll probably like this game, and if you don't, you probably won't. It's all about preference really, because even though we proved earlier that Breath of the Wild lacks proper Zelda dungeons and has an enemy variety problem, it really doesn't matter if you don't care about those things. But for the people it does matter to, it really matters. It matters enough to make them hate Breath of the Wild. If you enjoyed this type of content, be sure to check out this video on Banjo-Tooie.